This is the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol, built by Isengard Kingdom Brunel. And you might wonder what this has got to do with adhesions. The answer is 130 years ago, Sir Frederick Treves made this statement. That's the chap who uh, took out the king's appendix and also looked after the elephant man. I hope things are a little safer now, but it is a dangerous condition. And it's also very expensive. This is the figure for the cost of adhesions 10 years ago in the United States. 20 years ago, Harold Ellis made this statement, that there seems to be a sense of fatalism about adhesions. And 10 years ago, Lena Holmdahl came out with this statement saying that they're really underappreciated and that the medical fraternity have really been negligent in not addressing the problem. How do they occur? Well, this is the nice simplistic diagram to see how an adhesion occurs. And these are the things that tend to cause them. So if you run down the list of factors that cause the problem, you can then address the problem. And these are the sort of things that you would want to do. Decrease the infection risk, avoid contamination. They're all pretty obvious things. Minimize the tissue handling, uh, don't use starch gloves, and so on. Many of these things we're doing already. The question is, can we add to that? Well, quite a few drugs have been tried. Non-steroidals, which are anti-inflammatory, of course, but they widely studied, but of questionable efficacy. Corticosteroids cause a lot of immunosuppression and problems, so people tend not to use them. And fibrinolytics always run the risk of bleeding, so nobody uses those. We then have site-specific agents, in other words, things that work where you put them. And there are quite a few of these available these days. There's Gore-Tex, PTFE, which many of you have used in vascular surgery and so on. You have to stitch this in place. Uh, and then take out the stitches a few months later, so it sort of defeats the purpose, really. But it has been shown to decrease post-operative adhesions in many papers. Interseed, well, this is oxidized, regenerated cellulose. It's not often used in general surgery, but it does have uh, FDA approval. In fact, it was the first one to get it. Lots of clinical studies. Um, you can use it anywhere in all surgical procedures, and you can use it laparoscopically. But the problem is that it doesn't work if you get blood on it. So from my point of view, it's useless. Um, also, irrigants have to be removed, and it can be a bit difficult to apply. Saprofilm. And this is a, a, a barrier, carboxymethylcellulose barrier. Very good, strong evidence base. It's used a lot in the United States, I know. Uh, it works where you put it, but it can be a bit difficult to place. It sort of sticks to your fingers a bit when you're putting it on. Uh, but if you're careful, you can get it there. The limitations really are its handling, uh, and uh, you've got to remove all irrigation fluid. You cannot use it laparoscopically. I've tried numerous occasions. You just can't do it. And you mustn't use it at the anastomosis. There's actually a, a rider on one of their papers saying don't use it. The other problem is cost, which may not be a factor here, but it certainly is in the United Kingdom. There's no way that I would get this past our, our surgical financial committee uh, having to use four or five sheets for every major open operation. That's too much. But it does have an evidence base. This was um, a, a recent randomized trial, a lot of patients, probably underpowered, I suspect, because there was no overall difference between the two groups until you went down to a subset analysis. And you can see here on the bottom line, there was a slight difference in acute small bowel obstruction uh, in a subset analysis. So there, there are data there. There's no question that it works. Uh, but it's just difficult to prove, like many things, in, in uh, adhesion prevention. It's expensive. You need 62 patients treated to get to prevent one small bowel obstruction at a cost of about $40,000 for each one. Surgery wrap is a bit like um, a Seprofilm, but it's stronger, easier to use. Uh, you need to suture it in place. It's uh, polylactic acid. Uh, there's some published evidence for it, not as much as, uh, as others. Uh, it stays in, in the place it's put for about six months and then excreted through the lungs. Uh, and again, handling and cost are, are really the limitations, as well as what I'd call limited data on the safety. Hyalo barrier is uh, uh, a hyaluronic acid link. Uh, it's rarely used in general surgery. It tends to wash away with irrigation. Uh, it's an aqueous gel. Spray gel, this is similar sort of thing as polyethylene glycol hydrogel. 
there's limited data, it's very expensive. It works by mixing an amine and an ester together and then you get the hydrogel. And you have to add in methylene blue to see where you put it. So you've got a laparoscopic kit with the uh, two uh, things here and the open kit very similar, long uh, instrument. You mix it all up, you have to rinse, you have to spray, replace it, rinse it. It's quite a palaver to get the stuff in and you need five kits. So all in all, it's a complex setup, it takes a long time, limited data, not to mention the fact that a US regulatory study was actually halted on safety grounds and it's expensive, so it causes a bit of a headache really. Oxiplex is the last of the site specifics. Again, a carboxymethyl cellulose. It's a new gel agent, and I really can't find too much in the way of data apart from these three papers suggesting that it may have an effect. Then you have the adhesion reduction agents broad coverage, the ones that you can just put in and they go to every single area. Crystalloids, waste of time. They only stay in the abdominal cavity for a few hours, and of course, since adhesions form over five days, they're really not much use. Nobody uses dextrones anymore because of the risk of anaphylaxis. And Seprocote's been withdrawn because, frankly, it was like operating in a barrel of oil. Intergel's gone, caused a lot of pain, and it really did cause pain, a lot of serious pain, and it really had to be withdrawn for that reason. And Adept Icodextrin is available. In the United States, it has a license for gynecological use, but not for general surgical. In Europe, we can use it for anything. It's Isaiah's molar. Uh, it's got a big safety profile. It's been used as a dialysate for years, so there really is no worry about using it inside the abdomen. And it works by hydroflotation. It stays there for a long length of time. It's a bit like pouring a pint of water into a bowl of spaghetti. All the spaghetti rolls around and can't hold hands. And uh, this is a, a graph to show you how long it stays in the abdominal cavity. And you see where all the crystalloids and things have gone, the uh, adept stays in the abdomen for up to a week which is during the period of time that adhesions are forming. Big safety data in four, four and a half thousand patients. But the limitations, as always, like most of the uh, adhesion prevention agents, are the data. Nothing really in general surgery, but very good data in gynecology, a very good trial done in the United States here, showing definite reduction in adhesions and improvement in fertility rates uh, in patients undergoing adhesiolysis. What about laparoscopy? Well, there have been 16 comparative studies up to the time that uh, I came out here. Uh, 19 evaluations, favorable, 10 unfavorable. But the global results favor a laparoscopic approach. And I'll just tell you one study that is available online right now. Uh, this was a paper from Henry Dowson in Guildford in the United Kingdom. And they were looking at the uh, incidence of adhesion formation in open and laparoscopic surgery. They have 46 patients, the adhesions were scored by a recognized validated method, and the end point was the adhesion score. Uh, 69, nearly 70% of patients in the laparoscopic group had absolutely no adhesions whatsoever on second look, 3% in the open group. So the overall scores were those, and this achieved high statistical significance. So we're beginning to see data that suggests that laparoscopic surgery might reduce adhesions, and here's the confidence limits, the box and whisker plots, which are pretty self-evident. So it does seem the laparoscopic surgery does result in fewer adhesions, and I must say that's my personal anecdotal experience, but it's nice to see some data coming through. There's the reference if you need it. So, we've got the choice of routine prophylaxis if we take what we know from the SCAR data are high-risk surgical operations. These are the ones perhaps we have to concentrate on. Or do we do nothing? Well, if you do nothing, then basically they're not going to go away and you're going to end up with all those well-recognized problems that occur to patients who develop adhesion problems. It's an expensive business as well if you do nothing. There have been a lot of claims recently. These were the claims over a five-year period uh, in the United Kingdom coming to uh, 51,000 pounds, and that's before we really knew the extent of the problem. And you can prevent this sort of headline, which was recently in the newspapers in the UK, a patient who developed small bowel adhesion obstruction and who found out afterwards that she might have been offered an adhesion prevention agent. Thank you very much. <laughs>